Raider Nation. Thank you for joining us on the Only Nation podcast, brought to you by the Raider Ramble. My name is Heidi, but you may know me as Kevlar Prom Dress or even Raider Ladybug. I'm here with Raider Homer and T3 Raider Facts, and we're ready to talk some Raiders football together. Always ready to talk Raider football, and training camp is here. Yes, indeed. Training camp has started, and that's where we're going to go this week. So let's get to it. Today on the show, we'll look at some of the news and notes from the past week. And then we'll have several discussion questions that we're just going to break into and see where we go. We'll also take a look forward as we get closer to that first preseason game with Seattle on August 14th. All right, Raider Nation, this is the Only Nation podcast, so we want to hear from the Only Nation. Give us a call at 904-701-8667. That's 904-701-8667. You can leave a voicemail or send us a text. Here's the latest Raider news. Last week, the Raiders signed free agent punter Corliss Waitman to the team. Waitman originally signed as an undrafted free agent with the Pittsburgh Steelers in May of 2020. He spent his rookie offseason with the club after playing for four years at South Alabama in 2015 through 2018. You know, I guess this kind of makes me miss Marquette King. You know, he was a solid punter for a while. And, you know, we had Townsend for a little while. That didn't work out. Uh, A.J. Cole, you know, he's 26 with an average of 44.1 yards, tied for 16th with punts inside the 20-yard line. You know, I think Gruden wants a little bit more. He wants to flip that field, get this uh, newly revamped defense on the field and get the opposing offense off with the shorter field, hopefully with some turnovers. And that does start with the punter, you know, flipping the field when our drives stall. So I guess they want to have a little bit of competition with A.J., uh, but again, you know, we talked about competition being a good thing. Let's see if AJ can step it up, you know, and get in the top 10 with you know, punts inside the 20 yard line. You know, this could be a good thing. So we'll see what happens. But it's curious to see that they're signing a punter with training camp starting like this. Well, Corliss Waitman has made it onto the show. So that's a good thing. We can at least mention his name. And I'm hoping that between him and Cole, that they're going to have plenty of opportunities to practice with the punters. Hopefully, we won't need the punters a lot during the regular season, but uh, we'll just see how that all plays out. But I'm glad to see an additional leg so we just don't wear Cole out during the uh, during the training camp. Yeah, I like Cole. I like him a lot. You know what? I like Johnny Townsend as a person, and he remains the only Raiders player that has ever blocked me on Twitter. Sorry. <laughs> Whoops. Way to go, Heidi. I guess I was a little disparaging on that one comment. This is kind of a departure from Gruden's philosophy. I mean, he kind of got rid of King saying, we don't need that really good punter, that really big leg. We just need someone average to, you know, keep us in the game. And now if he's really pushing for somebody else to push Cole, that's kind of a departure from his line of thinking. But I also like the idea of just keeping Cole fresh and giving him a little bit of competition. Little competition always makes a player better. I believe that Marquette King was let go because he was, you know, he he's the type of player that gets penalized. You know, Gruden doesn't want his punter getting penalized. You know, I don't think that, I think that's really what it came down to. But he had quite a leg. Yes, he did. All right, the Raiders announced later in the week that running back Theo Riddick had been placed on the reserve retired list. The ninth year back out of Notre Dame was previously placed on the COVID-19 list, but now has apparently decided to retire. Best of luck to Theo Riddick. Now, I remember Riddick when he was in the league, and he made quite a bit of noise when he was with Detroit you know, several years ago. But, uh, of course, time and injuries have mounted up. I really didn't think that Riddick had a chance to make the team anyway. But uh, regardless of whether it was the COVID situation or just nine years of wear and tear on the body, I do wish Theo Riddick well. Uh, once again, I didn't think that he had a chance to make the team. He had a chance to do some soul searching, but, but, but best of luck going forward to Theo. So uh, yeah, I certainly wish him the best of luck going forward. Uh, last year, I figured he would make the team because of his veteran leadership, knowing how to play inside of an offense like Gruden has, and uh, you know I thought he had a good shot at making the team this year. Uh, this is kind of. Not what we needed, starting with uh, Kirby retiring, now Theo Riddick retiring, Rashard not necessarily wanting to 
take the vaccination, as we all know. This is not what we needed to begin training camp. But let's hope that, you know, Kenyon Drake and Josh Jacobs can overcome this because they are great talents. And and we need a running game this year. Gruden is loading up to run. So hopefully we can make something happen. You know, Gruden talked about being able to convince him to come out of retirement. So I do think that Riddick has a shot of making this team if he decides not to retire. Running back Jalen Richard was missing from action at the beginning of camp, and it was later revealed that he was added to the COVID-19 list. The day prior to this announcement, Coach John Gruden had made the statement that four or five guys on the team have still not been vaccinated. Back in 2019, Richard was very vocal about his opposition to vaccine mandates and posted several controversial tweets on the subject. He's also said that unvaccinated players are playing in jail. Since then, Richard's Twitter appears to have been deleted. We will keep monitoring this story as it definitely affects the running back room for the Raiders. And late Saturday, kicker Daniel Carlson was also added to the COVID-19 list. Those are the only two active players on the Raiders who are currently on the reserve COVID-19 list. You know, like I said last episode, you know, I want to see the season play out, you know, but I don't fault these players for having concerns with the vaccine. You know, I know that a lot of people feel confident in it. I took the first one. I never went back to take the second one. Uh, You know what I mean? So I'm not necessarily afraid to take it, but I can understand why some people are concerned. And Rashard, you know, going back a couple years already, has shown, you know, on Twitter that he doesn't really believe in vaccines. And that's okay for people to feel that way. Uh, But again, I want to see this season start out. So I hope that these players... We'll take this vaccine and, and, and not let it become an issue because we don't want what happened last year with COVID to happen this year when we don't have to necessarily deal with all that because of a vaccine being available. So, you know, I don't this could cost him his job, though. You know, it sounds like he wants to stand behind his beliefs and you can't fault the man for doing that. You know, he's thinking about his child, his wife himself. And you could say, well, he if that's the case and he should take the vaccine because they'll be safer. But then again. That's his right to choose. So I think that ultimately that's where we got to kind of stand at, you know, is that people have the right to choose. I don't know. This is kind of a touchy situation uh, because, you know, here's Daniel Carlson going on the the list. You know, we just signed a punter. Hopefully he can kick field goals. You know what I mean? (laughs) We'll see what happens. This is something that I don't want to become an issue this year, you know, as far as dealing with players on the COVID list. Well, you know, football is certainly a team game, and uh, and and while Jalen Rashard is fully capable of making decisions to benefit himself, uh, again, it does come down to a team game, and and I think that this puts him really behind the eight ball in terms of making the team. I think if it comes down to uh, him and one other player making the team, uh, you know, they're going to go back and take a look at this. So, and I think this will happen not just with the Raiders, but league wide, where you'll have uh, a player or two. It comes down to one or two players making the team, if it comes down to uh, somebody getting vaccinated and somebody not getting vaccinated, I think the the, the, the prejudice is going to fall toward the players who get the vaccination. Now, that's just a plain, simple fact. You can call it right, wrong, whatever you want, but that's really just the state and the nature of the way things are. So uh, we just have to kind of sit back and accept them. People will be free to choose what they want, but as I've said many times before, uh, there are consequences associated with actions. So uh, uh, you know, Jalen Richard right now is kind of finding himself behind the eight ball, and uh, we'll just see how everything shakes out once training camp finishes up. Yeah, I remember when Jalen Richard was talking about not getting his kids vaccinated. He was very against them. It um, doesn't surprise me that he's against uh, getting the COVID v- vaccine, which I agree with Homer. It is your own personal decision, and you should have the right to say no to an experimental medical treatment. That said, you know, I, I do have my first, first vaccine. I have to go back in a couple of weeks. But, you know, that's my own personal choice. I'm not going to impose that on anybody. Richard has the one advantage of if they don't keep him, who else will they keep? He is a great third down blocker and he knows the playbook very well. So that's something that's going to really be a pro on his behalf. But the one thing is these players, the ones that are unvaccinated really do have a lot of restrictions. They always have to wear their mask everywhere, 
when they're traveling, they can't leave the motel. You know, they have to stay there. They basically have to do Zoom meetings for him. There are a lot of restrictions that you have to have for just one player in the running back room. And it's a lot to deal with. So if they do get that player that can replace him, I think it would be a big toss up to see which one they keep. And I know I mentioned a few episodes ago that I thought that it might come down to that because I knew that he wouldn't want to be vaccinated. I think that the two that are that have been most vocal about it are him and Dallin Le- Levitt. I don't see Levitt budging on it either. I don't think Richard is going to budge on it. So it'll be interesting to see what they say and uh, what happens to the active roster when it comes out. Running back Kenyon Drake and undrafted free agent signee Darius Stills were both brought back off the NFI list and returned to practice after sitting out the first couple of days of training camp. I'm, I'm glad to see them both back in camp. Uh, obviously, Kenyon Drake is a slam dunk for making the team. Darius Stills is kind of on the bubble. Um, I think he has a chance of making this team. If not, they can try to stash him on the practice squad. But I'm really looking forward to seeing what young Mr. Stills has an opportunity to do in camp particularly when they come and fa- start facing the Rams uh, in, uh, in pre- preseason uh, camp scrimmages. Yeah, they said that Kenyon Drake was working out on the sideline for a little while, and then he went in and they put him on the list. Uh, I'm not concerned because he wasn't on there very long. He's back in practice already. Uh, I think they just want to be cautious with him because he is a big part of the game plan coming into this season, and I'm excited to see what the hell he can do. This kid coming out of the backfield, Derek Carr finding him in the flat, the one-two punch with him and Jacobs. I can't wait to see how that works out. And then Darius Stills, you know, he missed less than a week as well. You know, T3, you called it. You've been calling this kid's name for a while. You know, I think he does have a good shot at making this team. Uh, You know, and I think they're just, again, being cautious with him. I think that they like him enough to where they don't feel like he has to play uh, through injury automatically. They're just going to be cautious with him. So I'm glad that he's, they, both of these guys are back on the roster, you know, especially Kenyon Drake, because this kid's going to open up the offense, I believe. Yeah, Kenyon Drake's going to be a big part of the offense, and I'm not worried about him taking a few days off just to make sure that he's not banged up. He's going to be fine. To add depth to the running back room, the Raiders added two backs. Darius Jackson, who originally entered the NFL as a six-round draft pick with the Dallas Cowboys, and has also had stints with Cleveland, Green Bay, Tampa Bay, and Indianapolis. The other player that was added was B.J. Ammons, a back who was originally signed as an undrafted free agent by the Seattle Seahawks following the 2021 NFL draft. These are two signings that obviously are have been made because of Rashard and Theo Riddick, you know, not... Uh, wanting to take the vaccination. Uh, you know, Darius Jackson, he has some experience. I'd like his size. So if any one of these guys makes a team, it's probably him. Of course, we were talking in the green room about how I feel about this running back roster and what I think they could do with it, and we'll get more into that. But I think with the guys that we have in the backfield already, we're pretty good. So Darius Jackson, you know, if anybody's going to make this team um, from these two signings, I believe it would be him. But I'm not quite sold on that, and we can talk more about that later. Well, once again, you've got two young guys who have an opportunity to showcase what they what they have. Uh, I don't think either Jackson or Emmons makes the Raiders squad, but I think you're going to see a lot of them, uh, particularly during the Seahawks game and probably during the next couple of preseason games as well. So I'm excited to see what, what they have to offer, and particularly running behind the offensive line that we've got. So uh, let's let's just see what they have, and Who knows? We we might have a star in the making that we never saw, but it's kind of hard to predict that now, particularly if they're running behind reserves and playing against reserves. So uh, let's just let's see what happens come uh, August 14th. I wouldn't even be surprised if they don't sign another running back. Uh, This is in response to Riddick and Richard. So I'm not surprised that they signed a couple. And like I said, they might sign another one, another veteran uh, for experience. But I agree. I don't see either one of these guys making the team. Like I said before, I think Richard has the advantage just because he is such a good third down blocker and he does know the playbook so well. All right. So for today, we have five discussion questions. We'll each give our opinions and we'll just see where we'd end up. Here's the first question. 
Okay, looking at the defense, a lot has already been said about Damon Arnett, and the belief is that he may have already lost the starting cornerback job to Casey Hayward. Do you see Damon Arnett as a starter somewhere on this defense, or is he going to turn out to be just another squandered high draft pick by the Raiders? All right, here's what I think. Damon Arnett was drafted in the first round by Mike Mayock for a reason. They saw something in this kid, and I think they still see something in this kid. He battled injuries last year. He had the thumb injury. He had concussions. He had COVID. And there's one other thing that he did not have, which was good coaching throughout the whole entire season. Now, I see Casey Hayward coming in and nailing down that cornerback spot at the beginning of the year, but that's only because he's accomplished and he's familiar with Gus Bradley's system. But now you have to remember, Casey Hayward is a 10-year veteran, and he's on that scale of diminishing returns. He is not the same player that he was when he was a second or third year player. But I think Arnett, if he comes in, he's kind of taking heed to everything he needs to do. I think if he just studies Hayward and studies the system, he'll be there. And either should Hayward go down to injury, or I think he may be prepared to take over that starting role as a cornerback, hopefully by midseason, maybe earlier than that. I still really believe in Arnett, and I think he is the heir apparent to taking over that starting role as a corner. He may not be there week one, but I predict he'll be there by the middle middle of the season. I think you're right on right there, T3. Maybe they reached for him a little bit in the first round because they didn't have a pick in the second, right? And they knew he wasn't going to fall to the third. So they had to take a chance. They got the guy they wanted. T3, you just said it. You know, he he played through the, the injured thumb, had surgery, two concussions, came back, no real good coaching. You know, they threw this kid into the fire. Uh, yes, he had a couple of mental mistakes, like, you know, going back to the Dolphin game, right, when he let the guy run right by him. That was one that cost us a win, you know, that really stands out. But, again, he's young, uh, but he does have a lot of talent. So I think that he's going to be fine. Hayward coming in, I like that, right? It it, it shows, it lets Arnett kind of see what is expected of him from Bradley. T3, I think you're right, you know. I think uh, Hayward will start early in the season, and and if Arnett can really gain the trust of Bradley, then he'll be in at the end of the season because this is a, they added an extra game. This is going to be a long season, you know. Damon Arnett has every chance to really prove himself, and I think that he will. Uh, I think this is a good kid, and he damn sure has a lot of talent. So I think you know he'll be fine. This is not going to be another squandered high draft pick by the Raiders. Thank you very much, Heidi. I love how you put all that. I'm just reading the script. But he didn't, you know, show up and start playing as well as Mullen. You know what I mean? In his first year, but I think coming into his second year, he'll be playing much better. And then, but definitely by his third year, he'll be the number two cornerback and playing well. I agree more with T three. I think Casey Hayward has the job to lose right now but I do see them giving Damon Arnett another shot he was such a high draft pick they're not gonna give up on him that easily whether he's good enough to be that other starting cornerback remains to be seen you know right now on the depth chart I don't think he's very high up there he definitely has a chance to start towards maybe the middle of this season but I don't see him being there at the start of the season Here's another question for the defensive side of the ball. What does Clee Farrell need to do this year in order to warrant getting that fifth-year option picked up? Does he need to be a starter? Does he need to make a Pro Bowl? What does he need to do in 2021? For me, he's got to dominate against the run when he's lined up on the inside. You know, they want this kid to be able to play inside-outside. So when he's lined up on the inside, he's got to be able to dominate against the run and help out Max Crosby and Yannick Ngakwe on the outside when he subs for those guys. Just show up and be a role player this year if he wants to get that fifth-year option picked up. But then again, you know, we got two other fifth-year options that we got to think about also. You know, so it is possible, right, if some of the guys like uh, Solomon Thomas or some of the younger guys coming in that are making a name for themselves – they might beat out Clee Farrell and we'd go with them instead and maybe trade Clee. So we'll see how, you know, all this works out. But, 
you know, he's got a, he's good against the run. So in short yardage situations and things like that, that's where he has to really show up. Because not only is he playing for his fifth year option with the Raiders, but he's also trying to put some tape out there to maybe you know land on another team if he doesn't quite pan out with the Raiders. But you know they got a lot of defensive linemen right now, and Yannick signing Yannick. That dude, is he's not our number one pass rusher for the next couple of years, and I'm pretty sure he'll get extended. And then Max, I know we had talked about you know him maybe not playing as much, but I believe that he will play a lot. So he's that next guy that we really want, and his contract is here. You know what I mean? So uh, it's going to be kind of tough for Clee Farrell to really make a name for himself and uh, you know put himself in a position to beat out some of these other contracts that are coming up. Now, it was not Clee Farrell's fault that he was drafted number four overall in that draft. And I think that if he had been drafted in the 24th spot or the 27th spot, we wouldn't even be having these conversations. But there's no way that he was going to live up to that number four pick, particularly since a lot of people said, oh, well, here's going to be a replacement for Khalil Mack. He is not that guy. He never was that guy. But I will tell you this, that when Clee Farrell was in the lineup and healthy, he was eating up blockers, and that's he did that about as well as anyone on the team. I would I would highly question the fact that if he had had any help at all from Malik Collins or anybody else along the side of that front, he would have been even more effective than he was. But now, what do I see Clee doing this year to warrant getting that fifth-year option? Right now, he's penciled in as a number two, not a number one. And that's okay if he can come in and be productive because Gus Bradley has said he's going to bring his players in in waves. So if he's productive when he's there, continues to be that space eater and eat up those blockers, he doesn't need to make a Pro Bowl. He just needs to be steady. He needs to make a lot of tackles and create some of that really good interior pressure that a Gus Bradley defense really designs. He does all that. I have no doubt that he's going to get that fifth-year option picked up and then maybe even work his way back into a first-teamer. I think you need to look at what a fifth-year option costs the team. He's listed as a defensive end, and a fifth-year option for a defensive end is a lot of money. And he has definitely not played up to that that amount of money. Yes, he's going to be playing defensive tackle a lot. Right now, like you said, he's penciled in as a number two. You know, he's behind Jefferson, he's behind Thomas. And Hankins. I see him having to climb Mount Everest to be able to get that fifth-year option. I just don't know if he's going to be able to do it. He definitely needs to be at least a starter. You're not going to pay $12, $15 million a season for someone who's not. Let's see, him and Crosby were drafted the same year, right? That's correct. And Crosby only has a four-year contract. Correct. So they're going to want to re-up him more than re-up... Farrell at this point exactly I I just I don't see him picking it up I I don't see him playing at a high enough level what does he need to do yeah he definitely needs to be a starter he needs to dominate I'm just not sure he can do it but this could be one of those guys you know hey we took a shot we got the guy we wanted didn't quite pan out let's go ahead and trade him see what we can get and, you know, because sometimes players, they go somewhere else and they play well. It's just the way it is. This may be what happens with Klee, you know, because if Abram plays well down in the box, you know, you definitely want to keep him, even though we just loaded up on safeties, right? Uh, and then, you know, Josh Jacobs, right? You know, you definitely want to keep Josh Jacobs coming in with two 1,000-yard seasons, you know, first two years. That's big, being compared to Marcus Allen and Bo Jackson by Marcus Allen. That's big, you know, and then now you brought in a guy in Drake that can kind of give you, um, can maybe give him some longevity. You know, I think that's where our money on the fifth year options would be better spent. Because, yeah, this was one concern that I had back in 2019 when we had, we drafted these guys like, well, shit, how are we going to sign all these guys? You know what I mean? When it comes time to signing them. And then not even just Max Crosby, but Renfro. Right. You know what I mean? I think Renfro contributes more to this team than uh, Clee Farrell does. You know, this is going to next year is a big year for this roster. That's why they signed these short two year contracts with these veteran guys, you know, to come in and prove it. Because then it gives us an ability to re-sign our guys or if the other guys, these new guys come in and outplay them, sign them. So uh, Clee, good luck. Yeah, I, I like Clee. I want to see him get it. I just think that being drafted fourth overall 
and the price tag that it would cost for a fifth year option on the defensive end is just going to be too high for him to reach. So we'll see. Switching to offense, it appears that the Raiders have three players vying for two starting guard spots, Denzel Good, John Simpson, and Richie Incognito. Do you think Richie gets one of those two spots? And if he doesn't, does he stay with the team? All right, here's what I think. I love Richie Incognito. And I love all that he's brought to the team in the time he's been here. But I know he's 38 years old. I know he's overcoming an Achilles injury. Those are both really uphill battles. I don't trust putting him in that starting position because I think he goes down to injury pretty quick. Now, I have a lot of faith in, in John Simpson and the progress that he's made. So the way I see it right now, I see Denzel Good starting at that right guard and John Simpson starting at that left guard right next to uh, Colton Miller. I could be wrong, but that's what I see. Uh, he's a good young player. He's talented. He's ready to step up. And just like we've been retooling this offensive line, I say we rely on this guy now and go ahead and put him in there. Now, I don't think Richie stays on the team if he can't be a starter. So, again, as much as I would love to see Richie stay around, if he doesn't get a starter spot and ends up being in, in a backup role, I think he asks for his release. And he's perfectly willing to do that. Uh, it's, it's within his right to do that. And I think he probably could catch on with another team and be a starter. I just don't have faith in Richie to be put in there as a starter and stay healthy as a 38-year-old recovering from an Achilles injury. I just don't see it. So I think John Simpson and Denzel Good are your guys. Yeah, you know, Richie, you know, age and injury, those are concerns. But the guy is nasty, and uh, he's a team leader. So I believe that he is that starter that we're going to get on the left side. And then, of course, Denzel Good is going to be the starter on the right side. We just extended his contract. The only... Uh, backup spot that Denzel Good is going to have is right tackle, you know, and so that's when I think John Simpson will be utilized if, uh, you know, Leatherwood goes down or doesn't pan out and Good has to take over the right tackle spot, then I can see John Simpson coming in at the right guard, or if Richie Incognito goes down, then I can see John Simpson going over, over there to the left side. I think Simpson's more going to back up Good and Richie Incognito, but it's going to be a situation similar to Hayward and Arnett where as the season wears on, you know, you could see John Simpson take over. I think that's kind of where they're at with these younger guys right now. Some of them are going to be in position to take over this year, but the Raiders, of course, are just trying to, you know, be cautious and bring in some of these veteran guys to lead the way, anticipating some of these young guys becoming leaders and evolving and taking the job for themselves. So uh, for now, I think John Simpson's just a, a swing guard, backup type guy. Uh, and uh, Rich Incognito, if he can stay healthy, I you know I, I, I like him on the left side because he really helped Colton Miller turn into the left tackle that he is today. So Richie Incognito is valuable on that offensive line uh, and a valuable member of this team. But we'll see because the best ability is availability. We talk about that all the time. So we'll see what happens this year. But uh, for now, I got good and Incognito penciled in as starters. I'm with Homer on this one. I do think Richie gets one of those spots. I'm not sure if he keeps it the entire year. I'm not sure he can stay injury-free. He's got one of those spots, and if he doesn't start or if he goes down with injury, he still stays with the team. Uh, he won't end up on another team. At, at most, he would go on the retired list. I think that he's one of the leaders of the line. Like Homer said, he's got that nasty. That's just something that... It's an intangible that you can't really make up. They're going to hold on to that with him. So I think with his experience, with his leadership, he's got the spot. It's just going to be a matter of if he can stay injury-free and maintain it the entire season. And that, I think, is a toss-up. For our next question, we'll focus on the receiving cores. How many receivers do the Raiders keep? And who do you have making the squad as of right now? I mean, this is a tough one, you know, looking at the ESPN predicted depth chart, you know, they got 12 wide receivers. But, uh, of course, the top three that are going to keep, right, Hunter Renfro, who, in my opinion, is going to be the next greatest Raiders wide receiver. Okay, this guy uh, is Mr. Reliable on third down, can return punts, great teammate, uh, smart kid. So Hunter Renfro for sure. 
I believe, you know, he's going to be very important this year. Of course, Brian Edwards, the big body guy. At the end of the year, the last game where he got the touchdown against the Broncos, uh, Derek Carr put up that fade, and Edwards went up there and got it. So he's definitely going to make the team. We need that big body guy. And then, of course, Ruggs, right? He's that, the speed kills. You know, this is the Al Davis model with Ruggs. You know what I mean? So now, you know, you got... The clutch guy in Hunter Renfro, you got Brian Edwards as the big body, and then you have Ruggs as a speed guy. But the thing about that, though, is these guys are still pretty young, right? So, you you know, you know Gruden, he's a plug-and-play kind of guy. He likes his veterans. So, I see him keeping John Brown to come in and keep these guys level-headed or, you know, provide stability if these guys go down. Because, you know, of course, Ruggs and Edwards dealt with injury uh, bugs last year. Now, I'm going to jump to the sixth spot because Gruden was talking about DJ Turner and his ability to return kicks, and he's gloating about it, and he's feeling confident in him. So, you know, I thought that that's one person or that's one position that they would really go for was a a returner because, you know, they were trying to bring back Harris, but that didn't work out. So I believe DJ Turner will take the sixth spot. Now, a quick note, we talked about, you know, Rashard not coming in and his ability to block. I believe, you know, you can keep six wide receivers and keep Ingold in as a third running back. Now, I know Ingold is not necessarily a running back, but he did play wide receiver and quarterback in college, so in high school and whatnot. So this kid is a football player. And to me, I think he can be as valuable to this offense as Marcel Reese was to those offenses that he played on. So I like, you know, Ingold in and as the third down running back, he's a big guy, and then of course give him the rock if you you know in short yardage situations and let him go and pound people, and he can also jump over people. So I got DJ Turner in my sixth wide receiver spot uh, at, because we need the returner. Now that leaves seven people fighting for the fifth spot, right? You got Zay Jones, who I think his time in Oakland is over with. You got Aitman. I just don't think that he'll be able to make it this year. There's just too much talent on this wide receiver roster. Keelan Doss, the Alameda kid, great story. Loved everything that happened with him and him coming to the team and all this and that. But I just don't think that, you know, he's shown enough to keep a spot. When you got people like Dylan Stoner that, you know, are fighting for a spot and people are happy with what he's doing. And then, of course, you got a couple guys, Caleb Scott and Trey Quinn. I just don't think that they're going to make the roster for sure. But I'm going to go with Willie Snee. You know, and then hope that Dylan Stoner clears the waivers and ends up on the practice squad. Because, again, you have three young guys in Hunter, Brian, and Henry that can provide everything you need in a wide receiving core but are still young. So you you keep Brown and you keep Snead hoping that their veteran leadership can help these young guys continue to develop and turn into the great wide receivers that I believe they will be. So that's what I have. I have Hunter, Brian, Henry, John Brown, Willie Sneed, and DJ Turner making the team. And last year, the Raiders only kept five wide receivers. So this year, I see them keeping Ruggs, Edwards, and Renfro. No doubt, those three are right there. Um, I see them also keeping John Brown, and I see them keeping Zay Jones. So there's five receivers right there. I do see them keeping six receivers on the roster this year. So that sixth receiver spot in my opinion, is going to come down to either Sneed or Stoner. I think if he continues the progress that he has early, John Gruden is going to want to keep around the young guy, Stoner, uh, who is a possession receiver. Uh, He's really good at running routes, so I think that he's going to be a good addition to this team. I could be wrong, but as of right now, I see the Raiders keeping six receivers, and once again, they are Ruggs, Edwards, and Renfro, Zay Jones, John Brown, and Dylan Stoner. And those are the six. I think the key part of the question is, who do you have making the squad as of right now? As of right now, we don't have them playing in, in pads. You can't evaluate players until they play in pads. I don't think we're going to have a really good idea until we scrimmage the Rams. Then we'll have a better idea. But of course, we'll have the top three. Edwards, Ruggs, Runfro. I think Brown is a shoe-in. And as of right now, Zay Jones looks incredible. It's going to be a matter of if he can get separation once you put a cornerback and a safety on him and once you put him in pads. I think that sixth spot comes down to Stoner or Turner. They both look very good. 
They really do like Turner for returns. That one's a toss-up. I, I really would have to <laughs> flip a coin on that one. I say Edwards, Ruggs, Renfro, Brown, Jones, Stoner, Turner. And like I've mentioned before, I think Bruden is crazy enough to keep seven of them. You never know. I know you think I'm crazy, T3, but I think Bruden's just crazy enough to do it. And Homer, no, they are going to need a third running back. Ingold is a running they back. They are not going to use Alec Ingold as the third down back. He is a full so back. So was Marcel Reese. Exactly, and he was used as a full back. You can, you can put Ingold in. And what if one of them goes down with injury? I mean, then you sign somebody else. Like, you're going to have somebody. You're going to have another running back on the practice squad. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. I'm talking about on the active roster. All you need to do is carry uh, Jacobs, Drake, and Ingold. That's all you need to do is carry those three on the active roster. No, they're going to carry three running backs and a fullback. I agree. We shall see. We shall indeed. I just believe that Rashard... And Theo Riddick missing training camp is going to force them to do something that they wouldn't have done to begin with. Rashard definitely had a great shot at making this team because he can block and he can return punts. But, you know, he's not willing to take this vaccine. So he's not he's probably not going to make the team. And so for me, these two get the two kids that we talked about earlier. They're just not, they're not capable of doing what Ingold is doing, is capable of doing. And remember, we don't run fullback uh, formations all the time. You know what I mean? So he's not going to be worn out. He's going to be available. And I believe that if you utilize Ingold more, you know, you know, in the shotgun and things like that, I think that's going to be perfect for Ingold. You know, the guy's athletic. But hey, you know, whatever. I, I, I'm just saying Ingold is a better running back, better offensive weapon than Jalen Richard. That's all I'm saying. And I believe that his ability to run the ball, catch the ball out of the backfield, and block leaves the Raiders some wiggle room in order to, to keep some of this wide receivers that they, they want to keep. Like you're saying, if they went with seven, that means they're not going to have three running backs on the fullback, for sure. If they go with seven wide receivers, they're not going to have three running backs on the fullback. They're not going to do that. So if you go with seven wide receivers, then you keep Ingold and you play, you let him play a, a dual position running back, fullback. Remember, Zach Crockett was a fullback too, listed as a fullback as well. So it's not anything, you know, crazy to see that Gruden would say, hey, you know, I want Ingold instead of Richard. Now, because of Richard kind of threw a monkey wrench, and now we're dealing with Kirby retiring and everything. So we'll see, though. I'm going to let it go. If you have two running backs and a fullback, and those are the only ones that you have playing in a game, and one goes down with an injury, you're not going to have enough players. <laughs> yeah, that, that fullback has to okay. be a separate position. Remember, we still have Ragas uh, and uh, Groscheck as well. You know, they've both been looking really good. I like both of them. I really like Groscheck. Okay. Anyways, the last question is about Derek Carr. Does he get a contract extension? And if so, when? Or is it simply too early to tell? All right. Now, this is not going to make a lot of Raider Nation very happy, but I will go ahead and say it. Derek Carr is the best quarterback that we've had in more than a decade. Uh, one, of the, one of the best quarterbacks in franchise history, like it or not. And the stats back that up. Now, the Raiders, in my opinion, would be crazy to let this year go without going ahead and extending that contract. And I'm saying for another four years, that would put him and Gruden pretty much in sync with going out together. Now, Gruden is going to have to draft a quarterback next year, no doubt, because they're going to have to start grooming somebody eventually to take over. But as long as we have that ball security and Derek Carr plays the kind of ball that he's been playing the last couple of years and has that defense to back him up, not only do I think he warrants getting that contract extension, but I say it happens before the end of this season. Not in the off season, but I say it gets done before the season is over and probably gets extended for four years. That's just my take on it. I could be completely wrong, but that's the way I see it. Oh, is it my turn? Yes. Yep. Well, okay, well, the short answer is yes. Okay, he's definitely going to get a contract extension. Okay, the guy is performing well in Gruden's offense. Uh, as I've said before, he is 
he's somewhere between Brad Johnson and Rich Gannon. So, you know, you don't replace a quarterback like that. Look, what he did for uh, Aguilar, right? You know, people question whether he can elevate players around him. He got Aguilar paid. Aguilar came in with the drop season and got and left paid. You know what I mean? He, he's got the 24th quarter comebacks. You know what I mean? So the guy can play ball. Every year we've improved since Gruden. You know, he had to blow the whole team up. And so, you know, it's taking time. And, and Raider Nation is upset because they want to see win now, win now. Because, yes, you know, Derek Carr is the best quarterback that we've had in a long time. But we've had such a, sh- a long list of shitty quarterbacks. And we've been losing. So we want to win now. Raider Nation is frustrated. But the team, thankfully, is staying patient and playing the long game. So they know that Derek Carr is a very good quarterback. The guy did go to the Pro Bowl a couple of times, took us to the playoffs. Yeah, he got injured, but he took us to the playoffs. He's only missed a handful of games, you know, due to injury. He's Mr. Reliable. He's Mr. Fourth Quarter Comeback. You just got to put a team around him, and then there's nothing wrong with that. And so if you were to take Derek Carr out right now, uh, then you don't really have a chance of, of winning at all, I don't think. Yeah, you could say you got Mariota, but you heard Gruden talk in press conferences to, you know, about the differences and style of play calling that you had to play for each of them because Mariota's more comfortable with this certain style of play. Derek Carr's more comfortable with this. Derek Carr can, you know, sit in that pocket and wait until the last second like he did in New against the Jets and deliver a ball down the field and win the game. You know what I mean? And make a team pay for making a mistake like coming after him with such short time. But uh, Derek Carr is the kind of quarterback that De- John Gruden wants. And uh, he's, you know, coming out and saying that I want to be a Raider and, you know, I want to retire a Raider. If, if, if I got to go somewhere else, I might as well just retire. You know, I, I, that's the kind of guy you want on your team. You know what I mean? He's not coming out like Watson, Rodgers, and everybody else demanding trades. You know what I mean? Like, come, I mean, I like Derek Carr. John Gooden likes Derek Carr. Mike Mayock, MD, they all like Derek Carr. And, you know, if you want to win in this league and you want to win consistently, right, then, you you know, you get, your GM's got to be on top of it. Your owner's got to stay out of the way for the most part, right? Your coach has to be able to be, you know, stable, and your quarterback, too. You need stability in all of those spots. And Derek Carr, Mike Mayock, and John Gruden provide stability for the organization. So if you take one piece out, man, you know, you're basically rebuilding again. Now, they do need to draft again, so if they extend them, it'll be like a three-year extension, I believe, but I don't think they'll draft a quarterback until the second year of that extension, you know what I mean? Because they're still trying to build depth on the rest of the team, so, you know, you want to bring in a guy that you believe in as a quarterback, give you know, sit him on the bench for a year with a team that's built to you know, play well and then put him in there. So I believe Derek Carr will get the extension. They should, they possibly will draft a quarterback within the next two years. Or, you know, we'll have to keep an eye on uh, the free agents coming up here soon because, you know, Gruden does like veteran quarterbacks. It could be Nate Peterman that takes over. You never know. I'm just kidding. But uh, Derek Carr will get the extension. I'll also answer in short, yes, he gets extended. He does not get extended until the season is over. The reason for that is we've collapsed the last two seasons in the second half. They will not look at his first half of the season, say he looks great, and we're going to extend him. They are going to wait until the year is over. That's my simple answer. (laughs) He's going to have a good year, and he's going to stay consistent. He's going to have a good second half, but they are not going to trust him until the year is over, and we've actually won and will end up in the playoffs. I think he needs to get to the playoffs and that we will get to the playoffs. My short answer. It's definitely a lot shorter than mine. (laughs) (laughs) But we all see him getting extended. Yes, we do. Yes. Okay, T3, how about bringing us your top three for the week? T3's top three. All right, here is this week's top three. Number one, a lot of pressure has been put on the shoulders of Jonathan Abram, and he needs to have a true bounce-back year in order to assure himself a place with that fifth-year option. Now, some of the media have even commented that Abram must have a Pro Bowl year this year in order to be able to cash in on that fifth-year option, but I don't think so. If he can stay healthy and available all year, make plays, and just stay in position, I don't think he has to have a Pro Bowl caliber season. We just need to limit the number of times his name is called out for being out of position. Number two, last year the Raiders kept four tight ends, Derek Carrier, Jason Witten, Foster Moreau, and of course Darren Waller. 
With all the new offensive weapons added this year, I only see the team keeping three tight ends this year. But I don't think Derek Carrier will be the third guy this time around. I say watch out for rookie undrafted free agent Matt Bushman to get the nod. He's got the size and range needed at that position, and I liked his body of work when he was at BYU. So keep an eye out for number 84, Matt Bushman. And number three, this addresses the running back room. There is a 36-year-old future Hall of Fame running back entering his 15th season in the league, but right now he's without a team. Depending on how things stand when this podcast airs, I'm making a plea right now to the Raiders to bring in Adrian Peterson and add him to the running back room. He still has something left in the tank. He's an excellent team guy. And even if he were to not make the final roster, how great would it be to have him rub off on some of the other younger players? I can think of several guys the Raiders could cut loose right now to make room for him. But let's bring in AP while he's still available. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is this week's top three. I love the idea of bringing in Adrian Peterson. That said, I'm not sure that his past history with the alleged child mistreatment wouldn't be a consideration by the Raiders. But as a player, I would love to have him. I think he does still have something left in the tank. And I think that he would make a really good leader for the team. Uh, tight ends, I could definitely see us going with three. Who knows? We might finally cut loose of Derek Carrier. I know for some reason Gruden likes him. Hey, we haven't signed Paul Butler yet this year yet. You have beat we? me to the punch on that. No Paul Butler yet. <laughs> Maybe he's retired. I don't know, but I could definitely see us going with three. So I agree with you there. And from what I'm hearing, Foster Moreau looks good. He's big and he looks strong. Jonathan Abron, you know what I like to hear? He's not jabbering his mouth this year. He's being quiet. He's learning. He's trying to be a better player. That doesn't mean he doesn't still have that chip on his shoulder. But he's, he's maybe learning his place a little bit. And that makes me happy. Just stay in position. Yes. What do you think, Homer? I believe that Abram is going to have a bounce back year for sure. You know, um, last year, yeah, open field tackling really was terrible with him. But, you know, he was really great around the line of scrimmage. And so now they want to put him in the box and allow him just to hit people. You know what I mean? He'll be helping out on the short uh, passing game as well. And, you know, sometimes have to cover a guy going deep or whatever. But I believe that Bradley is going to have him in position to play well, you know, because there is a lot of guys behind him. You know, you got Carl Joseph, you know, you could see Muse and Diablo moving around in there if they had to uh, once Diablo comes back. But uh, I, I think that he will play well this year. The kid wants to play well. He wants to be a leader. He wants to do great things with the Raiders. And so he has that mindset. And like you said, Heidi, he's making the adjustments as far as not running his mouth as much as he used to, really focusing on on being a team leader. Uh, you, you know, you've heard that he's been doing a lot of studying and things like that. So I think this kid's going to have a great bounce back year. And he's going to be that safety that we all want him to be and, you know, show, you know, you know, continue the tradition of wearing number 24 and being a great player. Uh, the tight ends, you know, uh, yeah, just keep for me, uh, Foster Moreau, you know, Gruden is talking a lot about him coming back and being healthy. So I can see him having a bigger role in the offense this year. Uh, so I, I don't know about Derek Carrier. I like the guy, but, you know, T3, you've talked about it. Uh, you know, we know who he is. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with the tight end position. And then uh, as far as bringing Peterson, I mean, I like the idea, right? Apparently we need, uh, you know, a third running back. But, you know, at the same time, I believe that Ingold can be that short yardage back. They called the fullback uh, lead a couple of times, you know. He picked up a couple of first downs. I believe that he could become that third down running back that we need. And I think that if you were to sign somebody like Peterson, that's really all he would be is that short yardage back. Uh, but I believe we have that in Ingold. So just, you know, pass on Peterson. And we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, there's still going to be a lot of, 
running backs getting cut from other teams. So we still have a long way to go to figure out, you know, who's going to be available as far as a third running back. But, I mean, I just I feel like uh, Ingold definitely needs to be set up to be to carry more of a load in the offense. Give us a call at 904-701-8667. Leave us a voicemail or text message at that number or send in a message via social media and we'll share your thoughts. This week on Raider Roots, we're going to be revisiting the year 1964. So Al Davis is in his second year as coach and you're going to start to see some of the intriguing ways that draft picks were brought in by the old AFL. So that's 1964 this coming week on the Raider Roots podcast. Sounds good. Everyone be sure to check it out. All right, ready for Homer, did you know? Hey, Homer, did you know? All right, now it's time for another edition of Hey, Homer, Did You Know? In this segment, I will ask Homer and Heidi and the rest of our listening audience a Raiders-related question with three possible answers to choose from. It's multiple choice, so just give it your best guess. So here goes with this week's question. In terms of Raiders' single-season passing records, looking at completion percentage and at least 3,900 yards in the air, looking at the top seven season performances in Raiders history, Rich Gannon is number one with 4,689 yards and a completion percentage of nearly 68%. Five of the remaining top six season performances all belong to Derek Carr. Who has the other one? Is it A, Jeff George, B, Carson Palmer, or C, Kenny Stabler? Homer, what do you think? Man, I missed. I love Jeff George, but I don't think it's him. Uh, I don't believe it's Kenny Stabler either. I'm going to go with B, Carson Palmer. All right. Heidi, what do you think? I am almost positive that it is B. Carson Palmer because as much as people considered him a bust, I remember he had a 4,000-yard season. Well, Heidi and Homer, you are both correct. Carson Palmer is the answer. And actually, Heidi, it was 4,018 yards, and he had a completion percentage that year of 61.1%. So of the top seven... Performances. Rich Gannon had the number one performance, and Derek Carr had numbers two through seven, with the exception of number five. Number five performance on the list was Carson Palmer. So you both knew, and that is this week's version of Hey Homer. Did you know? I think we're on a three game win streak now for everybody. Woohoo! Yeah, I remember because I always thought, you know, that Carson Palmer move wasn't really that bad of a move. Because his stats were actually really good. And that confirms it. I remembered correctly. And now, Raider Nation, it's time for Heidi's Heroes. Las Vegas Raiders cornerback Keyshawn Nixon returned to his hometown of Compton to host a backpack giveaway to help young students for the upcoming school year. Along with receiving free school supplies, families were also given free food through the United Hands of Compton Food Bank. Jonathan Abram appeared with him, and they watched as students were given backpacks, notebooks, erasers, and pencils for going back to school. Together, they met with students, took pictures, and gave autographs. Nixon was awarded with a plaque from the city of Compton and a certificate from the Compton Unified School District. He was also presented with the Compton Community Champion Award for his efforts. Being able to give back is something that Nixon does not take for granted. He wanted to see the students he impacted in person. He said, spending time and showing my face is way more important than just cutting a check and sending money. I know these kids will remember this for the rest of their life. You can find out more information about this event in an article by Amanda Scurlock, a sports writer for the LA Sentinel.net, on their webpage. There will also be a link to it in their show notes. And yes, I directly lifted a couple of her sentences because she wrote them so well. To sum it up, giving back and working with the community are just some of the reasons that Sean Nixon is a Heidi's hero this week. 
You know, it's great. Anytime a professional athlete can go back to his or her hometown and contribute, not just to the community, but to the youth of the community. Keyshawn Nixon has gone way over and above that. It's great to see uh, that area of L.A. and Compton. They really need that extra hand up. And he's certainly doing that, providing that. So regardless of what he does or doesn't do in his career with the Raiders, he has certainly emerged as a professional athlete and a hero to his fellow people in Compton and the uh, Los Angeles area as a whole. So great job, Keyshawn Nixon. Yeah, absolutely. It's always nice to see, you know, these players go back into their communities and give back. You know, that's uh, it's important for people to give back to the communities, no matter whether you're a professional athlete or just some average Joe like myself, you know. So kudos to Keyshawn Nixon, you know, especially in a rough area like Compton. You know, and another thing, you know, that's special about this is right now, you know, a lot of Raider Nation is doing the exact same thing. You know, uh, right. The fan base is inspired by players like Keyshawn Nixon, you know, Darren Waller and everybody that does great things. that ends up on Heidi's Heroes, you know. Uh, so, Keyshawn, keep up the great work if you're listening uh, and all the athletes out there, you know, keep up all this great community work that you do. And that about does it for this week on the Only Nation podcast. If you'd like to help support the show, buy us a hot dog at buymeacoffee.com slash onlynationpod. You can find me, Heidi Stabbert, on social media as at Kevlar Prom Dress on Twitter and Instagram, or Heidi Stabbert on Facebook. You can also find me on YouTube on Captain Jack Rackham's channel every other Tuesday night. I join the DC wench Peggy Holmes and Angria Trask on the Captain and Wenches show. All right, Raider Nation, once again, training camp is here. Football season has arrived. It's not going anywhere until the end of the year, hopefully, right? So make sure that you follow me by going to the RaiderHomerChannel.BuzzSprout.com. There you will find links to all my social media accounts and my podcast on whatever podcasting apps you listen to. And please go to www.ChuckyStugs.com. And get you a Chucky Stugs flags. They're going to be doing a flag challenge throughout the season. So if you're going to be in the stadium close to the field, go to ChuckyStugs.com. Get you a flag. Put in the promo code HOMERFLAG and get $9 off. And if you get that flag shown on TV and you can send them footage, which all you got to do is just DVR it. And then you can send them footage on your phone of you holding that flag. And they will give you $500. So once again, go to ChuckyStugs.com, enter the promo code HOMERFLAG to get $9.99 off of your purchase. All right, Raider Nation, training camp is upon us, and our season is just getting warmed up. So now that you listen to our show, here's what you need to do. Send us your name and address so we can send you some free Raiders swag. Call us and tell us what you want to know. Throw us an interesting nugget that we can use on one of our upcoming episodes and become a part of what we're doing right here. Remember, this is the only nation, and we want you to be a part of it. So call us, 904-701-8667. That's 904-701-8667. Call us now and join the Only Nation podcast family. There are two easy ways to find me on social media. You can send me a tweet at T3 underscore sports 703, as several of you do. Or you can hit me up on Facebook at Tom, T-H-O-M, Jones. I'll do my best to respond back, and I would love to include your comments on an upcoming show. And thank you for tuning in and also getting involved. And I want to, again, personally thank everyone for all the additional support and feedback on the Raider Roots podcast, which is now getting ready to launch episode number five this week. As always, we look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, everyone. Go Raiders. Go Raiders. We are not just a nation, we are the only nation.